Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our last uh, academic talk, our last uh, sort of banquet, academic banquet that we have been having for the past eight days. Uh, we had a little bit of a discussion in the beginning whether we should have the all in five days, but sometimes you just need some breath and also because we need to uh, work with other things. So we ended up having a little bit of a break here, uh, last week and we resume today for this final uh, session with Professor Christian Maxson. Uh, so welcome everyone. I can see there are people from several places in Brazil. Professor Viviane Eberle, she was one of my mentors back in Florianopolis during my PhD. Then we have Professor Donna Mili. Miller, who founded Ch founded Cheslake. Cheslake is our partner in this event uh, from the University of Bologna. And Donna Miller was actually the, the founder of Cheslake. So it's a great honor uh, to have you here, Professor Miller. Uh, I will spot more people on the way. And thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to invite Professor Madsen in on screen. Uh, Professor Christian Madsen, he's currently working uh, at uh, as distinguished professor at Hunan University in Shangsha, China. I was reading about uh, the university, and it's actually uh, the oldest uh, university in China. They started in the mid 1900s uh, as an institute, and then it progressed into a university. So. Uh, it's quite a, an honor to have someone from a very old institution here sharing your knowledge with us. Professor Madsen has a degree in linguistics from Lund University, Sweden. He's originally from Sweden, and where he also studied Arabic and philosophy, and then he got his PhD from UCLA, which is the University of California, Los Angeles. He got his MA and PhD there. And he has previously held positions at USC, the Information Science Institute, the Sydney University, and Macquarie University in Australia, then the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in Hong Kong, where I had the, the privilege, the honor to work under his headship. And I should say it was a great experience. Uh, he has held visiting appointments at the university, for example, at the University of Hamburg and the Brain Science Division of the Reich Institute in Tokyo. He's honorary professor at the Beijing Normal University, Beijing, the Australian National University in Canberra, and guest professor at the University of Science and Technology in Beijing. Uh, has been involved in several text-based research projects, uh, since the 1980s, he was one of the developers of the rhetorical structure theory in a joint uh, project with Bill Mann and Sandy Thompson. Uh, and he has published widely in the field with over 106 uh, book chapters and journal articles. He has published three books and he has uh, supervised uh, a large number of PhD students, over 40, and among the languages it has worked with supervising the students is French, uh, Dagari Oko, Modern Standard Arabic, Bajik, Thai, Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. As you, as the audience can see, we are missing Portuguese here. So maybe somebody would like to step in and contribute to the field, you know, with some uh, language, with a project on language description with Professor Madsen. That would look nice in his curriculum, in his CV, and it works as well, right? So uh, we are very honored, uh, Professor Madsen, to have you here today. Uh, this is... Uh, Personally, it's a great privilege to have you here. It's a joy uh, because I graduated from this university and I actually always thought, okay, one day when I go back to UFAC, uh, we'll have Professor Madsen giving a talk here. So this is the first of which I hope of many other projects and collaborations, not only 
with UFHC, but with other, with other universities in Brazil, we need to create more uh, synergy, more collaboration, global collaboration, so that we can advance the field of linguistic studies. And uh, gladly, we have English as a, a global lingua franca that allows us to be here and share this knowledge. So Professor Matz is extremely generous. I've sent you over the weekend, if you haven't checked your emails yet, I've sent you a Dropbox link uh, with some uh, papers he generously shared with me. I asked him to select some papers that would uh, help us to build more background on this presentation today, which will be uh, very, very formative. Uh, but if you want to extend on this, pick up on these, and perhaps use these in your courses, etc., you have a place to start, and you can also always email Professor Madsen if you need something, if you're in need of something. So, Professor Madsen, thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, uh, we will have today uh, Professor Madsen's talk, and then afterwards I have invited both the Vice President for or the Pro-Rector, depending on the terminology we use in English, uh, the vice president or prorector for undergraduate studies, and also the vice president slash prorector for research, to be with us at the end of this event. Uh, I hope you all stay here afterwards because it's very important for us uh, as a community, as an academic community, that we also build this relationship with admin administration because we need them to push the field ahead, we need support and we need money, which we know in humanities is quite kind of scarce, but we do what we can. And we will talk a little bit more about that later today. So thank you very much, Professor Madsen. The floor is yours. I hope everything works fine with the connection. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, thank you. It's it's. Uh, very nice to hear from the uh, brains that the head of English at Polyu had access to uh, through energy and enthusiasm and uh, genius academic scholarship. Uh, it's a great uh, joy and a great honor to be here uh, to celebrate 50 years of uh, uh, Letras. Uh, let me just check. Uh, you can see my slides, right? Uh, can you also see my talking head? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you should have to see my talking head. Uh, I'm just uh, checking if, if I should be smiling the whole way through or frowning or what, what can you see? And I can see uh, the slide. I can see you, Francisco, and I can see myself. Yes, perfect. Okay. Now, uh, my only regret is uh, that uh, I'm not able to be there in person. Uh, I've been being promised by Francisco that one day he will guide me around uh, his, his hometown and the university and so on. But uh, COVID-19 willing, uh, it will happen. Uh, I'm chosen as a title, uh, Appliable Linguistics Emerging. Uh, the Empowering Potential Past Projects, Present Projects, Prospects. Uh, and it is obviously just a little bit of a sample uh, designed in a way to uh, make it possible to follow up in other contexts. Uh, now, this is where I am right now. So uh, that will, I think, explain why I only have a 4G mobile connection. It's a tiny village uh, in Galicia. It happens to be a beautiful day today. Uh, and I'm in one of these houses. Hopefully the 4G connection will uh, last us through the presentation. If it doesn't, uh, then Francisco has a pre-recorded version he can slot in uh, that I uploaded to shared Dropbox folder. Uh, this is where we're at in, the, in today's proceedings. Uh, I think we should have about an hour of me babbling uh, and then about 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, but, of course, any time you can stop me and say uh, to, if, if it's necessary to cut short. Uh, let me start with a pre-recorded uh, introduction. Uh, it was just in case the, it didn't work. So 
is a bit earlier today. Warm greetings. I'm Christian, Christian Matheson, and I'm here to give you a talk on the topic of applied linguistics emerging, empowering potential past projects, present prospects. I'll start with a contemplation of what a quantum of 50 years in linguistics looks like. And that's, of course, against the background of our celebration of 50 years of letters. Against this background of a quantum of time activity in linguistics of around 50 years, and then move on to uh, something that has certainly emerged in certain strands within linguistics within the last 50 years, even going a bit further back. And that's the emphasis on pliable linguistics meaning a kind of linguistics that has the power to be applied and is not only undertaken to feed linguistics departments, linguistics activities within universities and other research institutions. I'll take a few steps. First, I'll characterize the notion of applicable linguistics, asking what is it that gives a certain kind of linguistics the power to be applied to different tasks. Then I'll give some examples, specifically illustrating what systemic functional linguistics can bring to the party. Text analysis or discourse analysis, obviously. Register cartography. And then I'll take a step back and look at these activities in relation to language description, comparison, and theory development. And finally, in the conclusion, I just allude to ways in which the level of theory itself can support certain domains of application. So let's get started. So I thought it would be interesting to contemplate uh, what a temporal quantum of 50 years uh, might look like in linguistics. Uh, let's start by thinking what what how to what how to measure it. Uh, in terms of generations of scholars, uh, it's probably about a generation and a half if we take a generation to be thirty years, and that is of course uh, significant. Also, if we consider scholarship as a relay race uh, from uh, one generation of scholars to another, uh, it could be approximately academic working life. There are, of course, exceptions at either end, so extremely short, uh, like Benjamin Lee Wolf, only about 10 years uh, because he died far too young in his, his early 40s. Or at the other end, towards the other end, uh, Michael Halliday, around 40, 70 years of uh, academic working life because he started quite early as a research assistant to Wang Li in uh, China in the late 40s and because he continued working uh, virtually to the end of uh, his his uh, lifespan. Uh, if we think in terms of, of intakes of undergraduate students, this would be about 13 successive rounds of undergraduate students, approximately, or uh, PhD students, uh, quite a bit, right? Or 17 successive funded research projects, depending on the length of these projects. Uh, maybe, institutionally, about eight successive deans. Uh, in terms of vision statements that universities nowadays are very fond of, uh, maybe five vision statements. And if we think about taking a step back in terms of the development of the discipline and strands within the discipline, 50 years would quite possibly be long enough uh, to see a paradigm shift, a Kuhnian kind of paradigm shift. Now, let me put this on a kind of timeline in relation to different tasks. Uh, so in this timeline, it does from now uh, and then up to 30 years and beyond. And the triangle you see, that represents uh, the increasing scope of activities and products, outcomes of activities uh, as time increases. So we're talking about a few days, a week, a couple of weeks uh, then that's long enough to undertake text or discourse analysis. Of course, depending on the length and 
uh, nature of the text. Uh, but uh, we could certainly get started uh, and we might even uh, focus on a text, a set of texts where we can write up a paper during uh, just a few weeks. If we extend to a year, uh, then we may be able to get into language description. We can't complete language description because it's a much bigger task. Institutionally, we're coming to a point where we may have to attend to KPIs, key performance indicators. Uh, and I usually say to colleagues, you're very lucky, you're very fortunate if you don't know what KPI stands for, uh, because that's, again, a feature of the modern university is obsession with metrics of different kinds, uh, meaning that we spend often more time reporting on what we should be doing than actually doing it. Then you move up to three to five years. Uh, that might be enough of a quantum of time to complete at least the first uh, description of uh, some language, either one that hasn't been described before, like one of the languages on the Amazon region, for example, uh, or one that we're giving a new description uh, based on new evidence, based on a new theoretical framework. Uh, that's also the length then of a PhD program. Uh, so about enough time to produce a PhD thesis or research monograph if you're already finished. In terms of instit the institution, this is probably uh, approximately the length of strategic plans. If we then double that, that may be the time needed to produce a handbook and we now get to vision statements. Now, all along, there may be different funded research projects, uh, and they may be on the length of one year to three years, possibly five years. And if we get an accumulation, an aggregate of them, uh, then we may have a basis for a research center. And the research center would hopefully last for five, even to up to 10 years. Uh, if we go beyond 10 years towards 30 years, uh, that's the time needed to create holistic theory and meta theory, a paradigm, in other words. Uh, but that is means covering a lot of ground to be able to create this kind of theory. Uh, 30 years, that might be the time when we see a change in paradigm. Uh, but if we take the one I will be using, system functional linguistics, uh, that's still going strong uh, after a much long period of time. So it depends a great deal also on the nature of the theory and the meta theory. Let me use two illustrations to give a sense of what might happen, or what has happened within about 50 years of doing linguistics. Uh, the first illustration I actually take from the first half of the 20th century or late 19th century into the 20th century. Uh, and I'm using uh, the area of American descriptivists. Uh, and I'll just give you a little flavor of this. Uh, it's kind of a warm-up illustration, a couple of minutes. And what I'm using as uh, the starting point and the end point is year of birth. So I'm doing this not through linguistic activities, uh, not through theories, hypotheses, and so on, but through linguists. So I'll start with linguists born in 1880, and the cutoff is 1930. That's 50 years of linguists, uh, linguists active in North America, descriptivists. Uh, let me play a little animation of this timeline, uh, and then you'll get a sense of how you get increasingly populated uh, with different linguists over time. Uh, so if we try to do it for the last 50 years, it would be much harder because there will be so many people to take into account. We actually start in the 1850s uh, with two people who are important in Europe and in North America, Franz Boas, the anthropologist and anthropological linguist. Then two linguists very central in American descriptivism, 1880s, Edward Sapir and Leonard Bloomfield. Uh, and then a couple of linguists who in one way or another influenced the development in the U.S. from outside, uh, Roman Jakobson, of course, being the globetrotter, and Benjamin Lee Wolf, whom I already mentioned, was actually trained as a chemical engineer. But the next group, we get quite a few linguists born around 1910, uh, and they constitute then the second generation after Bloomfield and Sapir, uh, who really took 
uh, American descriptivism further. Different orientations, some more Bloomfieldian, actually most of them more Bloomfieldian, uh, but some following in Sir Piers, more anthropological orientation. You'll see many names that are quite familiar, some not so familiar. Uh, and of course, the year of death is also important insofar as uh, the time they had to train next generation or the subsequent generation and to make institutional contributions. So some like Eugene Nida moved into translation studies uh, and had a lot of influence in that area. Joe Greenberg, of course, uh, empirical language universals. Uh, Hockett, very diverse. Uh, Robert Longacre would certainly be recognized among people who've contributed to discourse analysis. And then towards the end of the 20s, uh, or in the 20s, we get some generativists who started their activities in the 50s. Bill Bright, editor of language for a number of years, anthropological linguistics. Noam Chomsky, uh, still with us, uh, generative linguistics, of course. And then a contemporary, a fellow traveler of Michael Halliday, Sidney Lamb, uh, relational uh, network theory, as it's called nowadays. So that's one way of getting a sense of what can happen in the time frame of half a century. I organized it around scholars, uh, partly because, as I said, it's a good way of getting a sense of successive generations, who the trained were able to train. Uh, so some were able to train many generations, like Franz Boas, uh, others have not been able to. So that is part of the different pathways uh, through uh, the history of linguistics. Now, the second example is, is something I've selected because it will be relevant a little bit later in my talk, having to do with uh, a, a facet of appliable linguistics. Uh, and this is no more about ideas, approaches, uh, and its approaches to uh, ideas about uh, functional variation in language, meaning variation in language according to the context of use. Uh, so I'll just pick up some point about register studies. Register being a functional variety of language according to context of use. Now, it's also been discussed under the heading of text topology or genre, uh, but I want to pursue the, the development of register studies in particular. Uh, so here is an illustration of functional variation, uh, but in, since this, this involves canine functional variation, it's also breeding, of course, comes in, and it's the biological order of systems, not the semiotic order of systems. But the principle of variation adaptation to environment uh, is really the same. As you can see in this uh, display to the left, there are a number of different starting points uh, in the history of linguistics, uh, leading to some kind of engagement with functional variation. The one I want to focus here on started in the 60s with work by Michael Halliday and colleagues, uh, where they, of course, built on J.R. Firth, uh, his notion of restricted languages, but generalized this uh, and used the term register uh, to complement the notion of dialectal variation, dialect variation, so register variation and the sense of functional varieties of language. Now, that led to other uh, branches as well, but there is, in SFL, uh, a kind of mainline of development here. Uh, and since the 70s, when a fair bit of work, uh, we can see in the last 50 years then, a continuing tradition of uh, working on register variation, on registers, and the long-term research program, which I've called register cartography, meaning mapping out registers, say the register that uh, make up a language. So if you think of a language as nothing but uh, an aggregate of registers, an aggregate of functional varieties, uh, that gives us great insight into language. Uh, also, when we want to think about languages evolving, because languages evolve, of course, uh, partly through the registers that emerge blossom and may disappear. Some are long-term stayers, uh, some more transient, uh, but it's through register variation that language remains stable. Uh, languages don't die unless they're catastrophic tradition, conditions, which they often are, through uh, colonization, for example. Uh, 
now uh, that's how languages remain stable or rather meta stable so through changing makeup of registers uh, languages remain stable and continue to adapt to the changing uh, environment to the changing uh, context of culture and community so this is still in sfl now if we take the 60s as the beginning of register studies we can say it took something like 50 60 years for a journal absolutely dedicated to the topic of register studies to emerge and this was launched by doug biber as an honorary editor an old friend of mine uh, and a number of editors a couple of years ago uh, and the very first issue uh, they asked a number of us to uh, talk about the approach to register in different linguistic theories, frameworks, traditions. Uh, so I wrote about register and systemic functional linguistics. And that would be part of the little package that Francisco gave you. Now, the link here to the general theme of my talk is that register cartography, so the mapping out of registers, the ones that compose a language, or the registers that compose an institution, or some site within an institution, uh, is the, the notion register is a fundamental aspect of the pliability of a linguistic framework. So there are so many possibilities that are open up if uh, the holistic theory of language includes centrally a notion of functional variation, of register variation. Now, language, a theory of language, the architecture of language, that enables us to do this. Uh, one example then would be systemic functional linguistics as a kind of applicable linguistics. And one reason why it is very powerful as a resource in application is its holistic nature. Uh, and it achieves its holistic nature by being a kind of relational, multidimensional theory of language in context. So there are different dimensions, familiar many of them, global ones that organize the totality of language and context and more local ones that organize some subsystem. This means then that in some sense the location or the phenomenon of functional variation falls out automatically uh, once we begin to contemplate the architecture of language and context. So in terms of functional variation and the topic of register variation uh, we can locate it uh, along two dimensions in the first instance. And I'm using here a version of a, uh, a visualization that Michael Hall and I designed for the third, uh, for the cover of the third issue of his Introduction to Functional Grammar. Uh, in terms of the kind of instantiation, that's this dimension, it's sort of mid region uh, between the overall meaning potential of a language uh, and the actual meaning in some uh, instantial specific text. So that's region, uh, that is functional variation or register variation. And in terms of the horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical dimension, the hierarchy of stratification, register variation is in the first instance, variation in meaning, semantic variation in some particular kind of context. So semantic variation in some context of use, recurrent context of use. Uh, and that's why Halliday, uh, already in the 70s, characterized register variation as uh, meanings and risk in context. Now, it's semantic in the first instance, but because semantics and lexical grammar uh, stand in a natural relation to one another, forming the content plane of language as a higher order semiotic, it ripples through into lexical grammar. So we can study it from below, as it were, uh, from the point of view of lexical grammar. So including register variation is one property of applicable linguistics. It opens up, as I said, many possibilities. Applicable linguistics then means precisely potential can be applied. I mean, you get that in the derivational morphology, right? Can be applied. So it doesn't mean is applied in a particular application. Rather, it's the relationship, the ongoing dialectical, dialogical relationship as different phases between theory and application. So if we look at different approaches to linguistics, we could, to simplify, 
say the two two basic orientations appliable linguistics and non-appliable linguistics what would non-appliable linguistics be well theoretical linguistics that's not designed to be applied uh, like Chomsky's linguistics another way of putting it would be it's highly tailored it's a highly restricted kind of linguistics uh, tailored to the pursuit of questions about the source and nature of knowledge uh, that originated in Western philosophy, epistemology, and the contrast between empiricism and rationalism, and the pursuit of a rationalist position, uh, trying to find what is universal grammar, so innate. Now, you could, of course, say there's an application, but it's a very, very restricted one. At the same time, you could say applied linguistics is not applicable because it's already applied. It's actual, not potential. Appliable then means potential to be applied. Uh, and I've already mentioned SFL, System of Functional Linguistics. Uh, but another candidate we could discuss is, uh, for example, to, is Tegmimic Linguistics. But the range of applications has been uh, much narrower. Essentially, applications uh, tied ultimately to missionary work, uh, Bible translation, and other activities that go with that like the development of graphologies, orthograph orthographies, and so on. This is how Michael Halliday characterized applicable linguistics uh, around the time when he first introduced the term, uh, almost two decades ago. Uh, so in this quote, he says, the search for what I've called an applicable linguistics, a comprehensive and theoretically powerful model of language, which precisely because it was comprehensive and powerful, would be capable of being applied Notice this, <laughs> this word, incapable of being applied to the problems, both research problems and practical problems that are being faced all the time by the many groups of people in our modern society who are in some way or other having to engage with language. So you can see from this formulation uh, that it also implicates his notion of social accountability. So if we're lucky enough to be given positions as academics in universities, with that uh, comes a need to reflect on our social accountability. And of course, systemic functional work in educational context is a brilliant example of this kind of uh, concern. So let me list uh, a number of properties of applicable linguistics, just expanding, elaborate a little bit on what Halliday says. Uh, if we focus in the first instance, particularly on Applicable linguistics as far as discourse analysis or text analysis is concerned, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, then this kind of linguistics must reference a comprehensive description of language and culture, of the language and culture that's in focus. So it has to be comprehensive. It can't be just little fragments that have been sketched in. Now, it may be uh, fairly indelicate, uh, scale one to a million, uh, but it should cover the whole territory so that no, we know what we're uh, exploring, uh, what we're exploring in the in the application. So that means that as many regions of language and culture must have been described so that we can analyze text and context uh, in situations systematically, not just pecking at the text, but systematically analyzing it, either in terms of all systems described or in terms of an informed selection of a subset of systems. But it has to be informed. It not just uh, t pulled out of a hat. Uh, and this includes then centrally, as you can see, register variation, which is why I use that as an illustration of uh, 50 years of uh, linguistics. It should actually also be reasonably explicit uh, so that analysts can easily relate manual analysis to automated analysis, treating them as complementary forms of analysis. This means that the relations between strata, axes, ranks, and so on should be spelt out by means of realization statements, not hand-waving, in other words. Further, uh, it should be both multilingually and multisemiotically oriented. So it must be able to deal with different languages, either one by one or in combination, as in translation, contrastive analysis, comparative studies, and it must be able to deal with different semiotic systems, again, either one by one or in combination, MDA, multimodal discourse analysis. And it must provide an account of the context in which we undertake these uh, tasks. 
the context of discourse analysis. So it is possible to relate features of this context to the nature of the analysis undertaken and to reason about analytical choices. So this, in a sense, the meta context, the meta context of doing linguistics. And we can relate this to uh, Michael Haller's notion from 1964 of syntax and the consumer and something picked up in the context of their work in educational linguistics by Jim Martin in 1998, uh, linguistics and the consumer. So that context should help us reason, characterize and reason about uh, context of consumption, as it were. And then, in a sense, a, a, a meta requirement, very important today. So it must be geared towards data sharing and reuse of analyzed texts. And this is to take the step beyond the sort of tradition in the humanities uh, the scholars tend to work one by one, as it were, rather than in teams. Uh, but we're certainly moving towards uh, team-based linguistics, uh, where the teams uh, may exist, uh, may have members around the world, uh, and where there is a sense of accumulation of resources, even just the real resources as an, a development, a compilation of corpora, but also analyzed text. And I think this is something that needs a good deal of emphasis uh, and help. Now, the notion of ADA, Appliable Discourse Analysis or Text Analysis, uh, that means that we're positioning the notion of appliability at the instance pole. Uh, and what is at the instance pole of the Kleiner instantiation? Well, it's semiotic weather, linguistic weather. So text in context or situation. And I can think of no better illustration than this extraordinary exhibition uh, at the uh, Museum of the Portuguese Language. It's a temporary exhibition, uh, but it was there in 2006. Uh, and it's uh, thanks to Francisco that I became aware of this because uh, taking me around is a Cicerone around Sao Paulo. Uh, he took me to this museum and to this special uh, exhibition. Uh, what you see here is text, in fact, the manuscript pages of a very well-loved uh, novel, a Portuguese-Brazilian novel, uh, set in the Sertão uh, of Brazil. Uh, we could look at this, then it's all the manuscript pages, actually, with the author's corrections. We can look at it as text, as artifact. So this text has value in its own right, and we might we will examine it uh, as a unique text, as we would uh, with any text in a recreating context that is given value uh, as a high value text uh, literature of any any kind, right? So this is it. We would treat it the Yanda Sata Veredas as artifact, and there are many occasions where this is important, uh, and with a a uh, colleague in, in India, Professor Vimra Bosley, uh, we're analyzing the preamble to the Indian constitution and talking to Francisco about this. This will be another, it's not literature, of course, in the narrow sense, but another example of a very highly valued text we treat as an artifact. And I've looked at the basic law of Hong Kong, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are many texts of this kind uh, that would be regarded as the canon of some particular uh, culture in one or more languages. But also, of course, very often we treat text as specimens. Uh, that is, of course, typically how texts are treated in uh, any corpus-based approach. Uh, the texts are not important in themselves, only as evidence uh, for claims we want to make about something that is more general. So sliding up the client of instantiation all the way towards the total language system or say some registerial subsystem. Then we treat text as specimens. The analysis of text then means that we take some, we opt, uh, adopt an observer point, uh, point of view uh, and we, uh, some analytical framework. Uh, and that was also illustrated, in fact, at the this brilliant exhibition. So you could trot around uh, the exhibition hall uh, and then you could look at these manuscript pages from different vantage points. And there were even magnifying glass that allow you to look at them from a particular angle. So that was controlled. Beautiful illustration of text analysis. Uh, 
right? So the analysis of text, uh, you have some tool, uh, you use technology very po possibly, and text analysis, of course, is empowered by T and T. Uh, the first T is technology, tools, like a magnifying glass. Uh, in the history of science, the telescope was the first brilliant example. Then shortly afterwards, the microscope, and much later, the stethoscope, and so on. Nowadays, people always think about the computers. Uh, but technology on its own is uh, not enough, not by any means. We also need theory. And theory, of course, means uh, scholars, research students, researchers, uh, theorizing. But when we have uh, some instrument look at the text, uh, it will give us a particular angle of vision. We may look at a close up at a distance. And as I said, this was precisely illustrated by this uh, quite extraordinary exhibition. So you could move around, you can see you could uh, clamber up uh, steps uh, to look at the text from above or from below. You could hoist down the pages. Uh, they were held up, balanced with a bag of, of dust from the Sertal. Uh, this is then uh, what we might attack with a pliable discourse analysis. As an instance of a pliable linguistics, a pliable discourse analysis at the instance pole of the Klein instantiation. So we can locate this within a pliable linguistics. And we're going to say a pliable linguistics has a span all along the Klein of instantiation. What I'm talking about now, a pliable discourse analysis. But at the other end, equally important, would be a pliable system description. Now, when we look at descriptivists, I started with the American descriptivists in the first half of the 20th century. Very often they described languages for a variety of reasons. Uh, one was, of course, in a sense, internal consumption linguistics. Uh, another was a sense of uh, urgency in documenting languages that were disappearing through a combination of genocide and semicide, uh, killing off uh, communities with the spreading uh, colonization of, of North America. And that's still with us, uh, the sense of the urgency of language documentation. Uh, also revival and so on. Uh, but if we think about what a pliable language description would be, uh, it would actually widen the horizon considerably because that would mean uh, developing descriptions of languages in such a way that there are resources not only for linguistics, uh, but also for the communities of speakers. Importantly, of course, uh, educational applications. So you could give a community language a description that would help the members of that community uh, learn through language other than whatever the standard language happens to be. So give them a richer resources uh, in the educational system at different stages. Appliable discourse analysis. Uh, as I've already said, I mean this in a very general sense. So any, any issue that comes up in a community, whether internal to a research institution, institution of higher learning, or external to it, in some other institution of the institutions that make up a community, that's where you move in with application. And I'd let, just like to contrast that with uh, other approaches to discourse analysis other than ADA uh, that are much more specialized. Uh, so let me do this briefly before moving on to illustrations of what one can do with systemic functional linguistics in, in, in uh, discourse analysis. Uh, and when we consider tailored or specialized approaches to discourse analysis, we can actually identify them according to the three parameters of context, field, tenor, and mode. So there are a number of them that are specialized uh, they're concerned with the task of shedding light on some aspect of tenor, uh, like the power dimension of tenor or status, inequality, domination, discrimination, and so on. And that coming out of critical linguistics as one source is, of course, CDA, critical discourse analysis. So it's a special setting of discourse analysis uh, designed specifically to shed light on, uh, on this aspect of tenor. 
then you can see there is say there's this Jim Martin's uh, complementary development also concerned with tenor but solidarity uh, positive discourse analysis or PDA but there are of course many approaches to discourse analysis that focus on other aspects of tenor institutional role for example so professional discourse analysis has emerged in the last couple of decades if we turn to mode uh, then again, there are specialized forms of discourse analysis. Uh, if in mode the turn is dialogic uh, and uh, also fairly spontaneous, pre, not, not, not pre-allocated and so on, then this is the approach that emerged in sociology, microsociology, uh, informed by ethno, uh, ethnomethodology and other trends in, in microsociology at the time, CA, conversation analysis or multi-modality, so multimodal discourse analysis. And field, uh, just as an example, because there are many, it would be the social semiotic process or the field of activity, recreating, uh, and so various approaches to the discourse analysis of literature, stylistics, literary analysis, narrative analysis, and so on. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but the point I want to make is my aspiration for ADA, for applicable discourse analysis, is ADA should cover all these. So be powerful enough to take on all these tasks and other tasks, other tasks that can, in very, very broad terms, improve the human condition. Now, systemic analysis. So let me just focus on that for a little while uh, and suggest what SFL can contribute within the broad concept of, of ADA, of a private discourse analysis, through a systemic part. Uh, so the systemic part, on the one hand, it means systematically relating instances, texts that we're analyzing, to the description of the potential, the system, the system that is being instantiated. So no hand-waving. You have to relate them. Uh, and if the description of the system uh, doesn't support it, you revise the description, you expand it. That's one way in which you could say it's an abducti abdu abductive approach. So very, very simple example. If you have the interpersonal grammatical system of mood in English, uh, and you meet a clause in a text, like a traditional narrative rendered in English, soon Ali Dantaro became good friends, uh, the act of analysis, you could match patterns. You see subject before finite. If subject is before finite, systemically, uh, that means it's a declarative clause. If it's declarative, it's also indicative, it's also free, also major, it's a clause. So that's the systemic uh, part of the analysis, which you can do a lot with. So it's looking at the choices behind the text but it's not just looking at the choices behind the text, it's also allowing us to examine the text against the background of what one might call shadow text. So closely related or agnate texts that could have been, that might have been, but are not, not the actual text. And that can, for example, be very important in thinking about strategies in translation, considering not only the actual text, but also shadow text. Now, if you look at successive choices, you make the choice, of course, in the analysis of one unit, the production of one unit. So in this case, clause, then you choose major, then you choose free, then indicative, and then declarative. But you can also track choices, a kind of microanalysis, if you focused on the grammar, uh, unit by unit. Uh, and that will give you a kind of score of selections. I'll illustrate this in a second. Uh, just to give you the sense of, of uh, picking out uh, a choices in the analysis. You take this little paragraph from a, uh, a topographic procedure. Uh, in blue, these are clauses that select for declarative. In red, these are clauses that select for imperative. So take a quick break come back to the spot pictured, climb the stairs and so on. And in this way, you can immediately see there's a pattern emerging. Declarative clauses most frequent. Imperative clauses come after declarative clauses. 
But if you think about the nature of the text, the register, topographic procedure, you know, in fact, the imperic clauses must in some sense be nuclear central. Why? Well, because they are the instructions in undertaking the procedure of trotting around some interesting part of the world. And then there are also a couple of bound clauses. Let me illustrate this, what I call a, a, a score of selections of choices for a bit of a longer text. Uh, this is a retelling of uh, part of Genesis and the Old Testament for children, the Noah's Ark story, many retellings of this. And what I want to show you is just a score uh, tracing or tracking selections in theme, topical theme, uh, unmarked versus marked. You'll have unmarked in a kind of pale red and marked in a pale blue. Let me show this to you. So I've just visualized this very schematically. Uh, let me magnify the first bit so it's a bit easier to see. Uh, and you can see very quickly that there is a pattern that seems to emerge that you have a marked selection followed by unmarked selections. Now, there are different, uh, different scopes of the unmarked selections, but that seems to be the pattern. And sometimes marked selections are more common. Now, when you have this kind of macroanalysis in the lexical grammar, one thing you can do is push up. So you say, how can I interpret this semantically or even contextually? And what you would find uh, is that this, of course, corresponds to episodic shifts in the narrative. Episodic, uh, episodic, sorry, episodic shifts uh, are signaled by marked themes in space or time. So shifts in the scene, as it were. And that gives rise to this, this kind of pattern. <clears throat> Note that that's, of course, specific to this kind of register, to a fairly traditional narrative. Uh, and part of the point is that uh, different patterns would emerge in other kinds of registers. In fact, let me go to another register. This is now a telephonic service encounter, uh, and I will use this passage. Uh, this is somebody calling a Pizza Hut in Australia uh, to order pizza, and you can call uh, a Pizza Hut to order pizza either for takeaway. This is Australia, so it's take takeaway, not takeout, uh, or home delivery. Uh, so you have the caller uh, and you have the operator, and I'll just uh, track this passage in terms of the system we looked at before, mood. So these are the selections clause by clause. On the horizontal axis, you have what we might call the logos genesis. So the creation of meaning uh, clause by clause in this case, uh, through the selections in the system mood. Uh, and then the red squares indicate selections. So you can see clause one, that's a minor clause. Clause two uh, is a declarative clause. Clause three, a interrogative, yes, no interrogative and so on. So for example, Towards the end of this interrogative clause, the operator asks the caller, would you like to try that? And the caller says, ah, no thanks. Now, to give you a, a, a sense of how, what this looks simulated, uh, let me just animate the selections. So the first selection, minor, then declarative, then interrogative, then declarative again, and so on. And we can just trace the selections over time. Now, we meet this text, of course, as a transcript. But in a sense, what I'm simulating here is a text, not as a product, but as a process. So we get a sense of how patterns emerge over time by tracing the selections unit by unit. In this case, grammatical unit clause. So clause 17. You have the selections. You see emerging over time. Favorite mood type declarative, uh, then yes, no interrogative or WH interrogative, no imperatives. So this then represents a text score. Now, text score is a term I've taken from Harald Weinreich. He used it in the 70s and he used the German term text partitur. Uh, and you can think of this like a musical score. The selections are like the notes in the musical score. The frequency then, it simply emerges from the successive selections. So let me illustrate this frequency. You can then just accumulate the selections and uh, this uh, trace of the selections uh, turn in, turns into a bar graph or bar chart. 
So longest bar here is for declarative, and that gives you visual representation of the relative frequency. So voila, uh, out of the uh, text score, the trace of selections in time, you now have a bar graph of the relative frequencies in the text viewed now as a product. You can do this for much longer text uh, or passages. This is the whole, uh, the whole uh, telephonic service encounters. Uh, now for all the systems of the clause, uh, color-coded bluish experiential transitivity process type, reddish interpersonal mood, and yellowish textual theme. Uh, and then what you have is the unfolding of a time logogenesis. So you have the text unfolding and you really get a sense of a score. You can think of the different selections in dark uh, as uh, notes that go together. So this is what it looks like. And you can begin to scan this uh, visually for patterns. And you can see this is a pattern that occurs so, in fact, it's mental clause with yes, no interrogative. And we can call this a chord, again, borrowing from music. So visualizing systemic selections in this way uh, can help you identify patterns. If you're in the lexicogrammar, you can then project upwards, as I said before, to the semantics uh, and uh, to the context. As long as you're in the lexicogrammar, you have some higher chance of automating some of the analysis if it's low ranking. Now, let me relate this back uh, to, to register cartography. If I was to characterize this particular uh, register in terms of its context, so the situation type, I'd say field, field of activity doing. So it's like language in action. You, you're doing the, the exchanges, the dialogue, in order to get something done to get pizza on your table, as it were, uh, typical on service encounters. Uh, the field of experience or domain of knowledge, fast food. Stick to the end of fast food and so on. Uh, tenor, just institutional role. Of course, there's more to it than that. Operator, caller, the mode, spoken, uh, nature of channel, telephonic, dialogic, and so on. So our little sample here then, analysis is precisely the analysis of a telephonic service encounter. And if we use uh, context, we can use field of activity uh, as one way of projecting a map or where this is located in terms of possible context. So let me do that. Uh, and using a display you may have seen before, uh, I've called it a, a, a discursive wheel of fortune uh, it's a kind of radial display of different fields of activity, I at primary, and then organized into secondary ones. And that's, one could present them as a system of work, one could extend the delicacy. The original work on the eight primary types uh, came from Jean Yeo, uh from a manuscript she gave me in 1989 on discourse analysis, but sadly never published. Uh, we can characterize these. Let me go around very, very quickly. Uh, we can start at the top. So these are fields of activity where through the text uh, we're concerned with expanding our experience of the world. So you could say this is knowledge uh, creation, but not just knowledge creation. It's about general class of phenomena. So and you could say in some sense, whether it's folk, common sense or uncommon sense, or uh, it is theory. So construing theory by expanding uh, knowledge. That's the field of activity. Then clockwise, reporting, going from class of phenomena to particular phenomena, so reporting our experience of the world, uh, chronicling events, as in news reports, as in history text, surveying places, as in uh, topographic uh, maps, as it were, that's constructed in language, inventory, entities, and so on. These tend to be factual, and they should be factual, we go from factual to fictional, so recreating life, prototypically, imaginatively, narrating or dramatizing. So this is activity where literary texts tend to be, tend to operate. Then sharing prototypically personal experiences and values, reminiscing, emoting, gossiping, and so on. Then down to the, uh, the field of activity 
where the tel I located the telephonic service encounter doing so language and action so undertaking social processes uh, directing collaborating where language is there or other semiotic systems to facilitate uh, say the exchange of goods uh, or the exchange of services then enabling some course of action either instructing somebody empowering them to do it or by regulating them constraining them in their behavior recommending some course of action for one's own sake promoting or for the sake of others at least notionally advising them and then finally exploring in a sense a public version of sharing but prototypically public values stances ideas reviewing arguing debating rallying and so on like a political speech where you rally people around some cause uh, one thing that's happened with the modern technology of the channel uh, the uh, technologies of the internet mobile devices and so on is the blurring between sharing and exploring as with respect to what's personal what's private and what's public now I illustrated for for uh, uh, doing uh, the unfolding of the telephonic service encounter that we move up to the semantics and do it structurally uh, illustrate how a text belonging to a particular register uh, unfolds uh, structurally through selections of course so staying with field of activity uh, and a reporting one so this is in fact a taxonomic report expanding knowledge but categorizing uh, some general class of phenomenon. So development, logical semantic organization of a taxonomic report. And I'm using the conventions of what Francisco referred to, we developed, began developing in the early 80s, rhetorical structure theory. Uh, from a systemic factual point of view, this is logical semantic semantics, logical semantic relations engendered, as it were, where choices in uh, logical semantic systems having to do with uh, logical semantic type and taxes. Now, the nucleus of the whole text is identified by the vertical line. That's the fuels of the body are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. You see that in developing the text, one could imagine one do does it step by step, uh, adding supporting satellites. These are the arcs or of equal status, these are the angle lines. This would, in fact, then be one way of writing the text. So you write it nuclear segments, satellites, and nuclear segments within the satellite first, and then you can fill in. And that gives you a kind of accordion-like sense of the text. So you could have a Reader's Digest version, which is just the fuels of the body, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, full stop. You can expand it a bit, you can expand it further uh, and so in terms of a pliable approach uh, i think this would and i know this can be quite helpful in teaching writing uh, it it takes us quite a bit beyond just the schematic or generic structure of the context of a particular type of text uh, because it provides the students with the resources with the strategies for expanding the text uh, and through registerial cartography, we can map out the favored uh, type of logical semantic or rhetorical relations in texts belonging in different registers. So contrast this text where elaboration is quite global. So you have a generalization and then uh, you elaborate on this generalization, body fuel by body fuel. Here is a text uh, that is uh, about exploring, more specifically arguing, a historical exposition. So in terms of the discursive wheel of fortune, we're in the exploring sector, arguing. And this is how that text develops. The uh, generic structure, the contextual structure, thesis, arguments, reinforcement. It has a nuclear segment as thesis. There were a number of reasons why the Renaissance began in Italy. Uh, then this is elaborated and there is just an additive sequence of the reasons, Roman Empire, independent cities, and so on. So step by step, they added. They're not a temporal sequence. They're just added. It could be in different orders. Once this elaboration is finished, 
with the last edition, we can link this to the most global nucleus of the text, which in generic terms is the reinforcement of the thesis. Thus, in Italy, a large number of educated men, the introduction of new ideas from other lands, a varied political structure and visible relics of ancient times encourage the Renaissance. Then this is restatement, restated somewhat more abstractly. History, economics, geography and politics contributed to produce the Italian Renaissance. Note of force uh, that it's quite heavy in ideation and grammatical metaphor. Now, if we look at this textually for a second, in addition to the logical semantic relation, you see that it starts with the macro theme. That's an all orientation to the reasons. But then the macro new, that's the take home. That's the final punch. That's the reinforcement of the thesis. So this is part of uh, what I called registerial cartography, or register cartography, is mapping this art, uh, context, semantics, lexigram, phonology, graphology, if warranted, uh, from one register to another, uh, going across context in terms of field, tenor, and mode. So one can see then that the contrasting uh, patterns, global organization in logical semantic terms, depending on what kind of register the text belongs to. Uh, I can contrast another uh, pair, the historical exposition I just showed you and a news article. Uh, so exploring, arguing, historical exposition, reporting, chronicling events, news uh, report. Uh, and let me magnify this. To the left, you have the semantic system of logical semantic relations, the choices that are made. Uh, and to the right, typical exemplars uh, of the registers of historic exposition news report. And you can see that in terms of global relations, they have different favorites. Uh, in historic ex exposition, evidence is a favorite relation because evidence is brought in to increase the likelihood that the reader will Belief in believe in the claim of the nucleus evidence relation, whereas a news report, it turns out the elaboration is the most uh, global relation. So in today's modern news report in the English speaking world after the 1860s or so, uh, the report is not a story, it's not organized uh, temporarily. Uh, rather, there is some nuclear event uh, selected to get our attention, to grab our attention. Uh, and then essentially the rest of the news article or report is an elaboration of this. Maybe actually successive uh, little sequences running through from the point of view of the reporter, eyewitnesses, VIPs, and so on. So that gives gives us the kind of inverted pyramid of the modern news report. So it looks much, much more like a taxonomic report uh, then like a historical recount. And you've already seen the, uh, the historical exposition uh, dominated by evidence. So what we can get is a sense of what the global relations are and the strategies. Then say students are learning to write uh, compositions in different registers can draw on. What are uses of such a registerial map, registerial cartography? Well, there are many. Uh, obviously, in education, uh, one can follow learner paths in different subjects or university disciplines. Uh, this can inform curriculum development, ensuring complementary mix of registers, but also sequence of registers, uh, which is sometimes not taken a very uh, seriously in, in the design of curriculum and the design of textbooks, of course. Uh, it would be another prominent example. Translator training, selection of practice texts, uh, not just a random sample, but sample according to the challenges uh, that different registers pose. And again, the question of the sequence of registers uh, that the students are invited to engage with. Healthcare communication, uh, for example, uh, looking at the relationship between patient and healthcare professionals, uh, patient-oriented versus uh, relationship center care uh, or following a patient and a journey through an institutional health care. More generally, what I've called institutional cartography, uh, 
what a good friend and colleague in Beijing, Gu Yiguo, calls discourse geography, uh, drawing this notion from Hegestan, uh, cultural geography. Uh, but the point is you can map out a, an institution or a setting within an institution in terms of the registers uh, that operate in that institution, characterize them semantically, lexicomatically, also contextually. You can profile a person, so you can think of a person in terms of their repertoire of registers developmentally as they expand their repertoire, uh, for example. Language description is turned out to be very important in language description, uh, guidance as to the selection of text from different registers that would help you get a start, get off the ground in the description of different areas within the overall uh, uh, system of the language. I said before that in terms of the global dimensions, uh, the phenomenon is located in terms of the climate instantiation, uh, mid-region, uh, in terms of the hierarchy of stratification, in the semantics in the first instance, uh, but in relation to the values within context, because it is semantic air variation according to the context of use. And since uh, the relationship between semantics and lexical grammar is a natural one, one can also approach it from below, as I illustrated right at the beginning, uh, for example, by systemic analysis, uh, systemic lexicogrammatical analysis of text, and then move upwards. So we can locate uh, what I've talked about in terms of the kind of instantiation. I started talking about text analysis. Then I talked about the selection of text from particular registers. Uh, and we could go further towards the potential uh, and, of course, engage with language description. And all along, the interesting issue is, on the one hand, how long does it take? And on the other hand, uh, what is an appliable version of it? I mean, how can we undertake it in such a way that it is a resource, uh, it's a resource for application. Let me come back to the timeframes that I used at, right at the beginning. Uh, and I made the point already that text analysis in principle could be a matter of days or weeks, depending of course on the length of the text, the challenge it poses. Whereas language description, we're now talking about years possibly something you can squeeze in, the sort of first round uh, within a PhD thesis or within one funded project, if it's reasonably well funded. But if we push on beyond language description, uh, we're bound to need more time. And that's very important to be aware of uh, when we think about uh, appliable linguistics and we think about uh, what we can achieve in different research projects over different time frames. Let me now locate these in a hierarchy of linguistic activities, meaning activities undertaken by linguists of increasing complexity. Uh, and I, this hierarchy says analysis, description, comparison theory. Uh, and the basis for saying that they're increasing challenge and complexity is the domain one has to cover goes from small, a single text, maybe a short text, to very large. I've talked about text analysis. I've talked about referred to language description. In between, you would have register analysis or register description. Now, it makes sense then. A register, if you want to characterize the register, we have to select a number of texts. So we have to have a reasonably uh, large sample of text. Similarly, if we want to describe a language, we have to select text from a reasonably large number of uh, registers. If, on the other hand, we move from the description of particular languages to theorizing uh, the uh, language as a human system in general, right? Uh, then we have to have, we have to cover much more ground. Why is that? Well, because we have to have some reasonable sample of languages uh, that along different dimensions are very different. So we know that the theory is a general theory of language and one that is powerful enough to be engaged in the description of any language we're likely to encounter. Of course, we may have to adjust the theory along the way. Uh, 
and comparison then is more uh, challenging than language description simply because we have to cover the ground of uh, more than uh, more than one language description many many uh, possibly if you go to language typology all right a bit of a time uh, let me uh, wind up conclusion we can use this ordered typology of activities undertaken by linguists to think about regions of applicability. So I've already talked about ADA, and I spent most of time, my time on that. So ADA, you could imagine, just as examples, regions of applicability, translation studies, healthcare communication studies, forensic linguistics, critical or positive discourse analysis, and many other tasks where text or discourse analysis uh, will be an important step towards addressing some problem that uh, arises in the community. Uh, if you move up to language description and comparison, uh, examples of applicability would be educational linguistics, uh, where we need to characterize the language of a certain discipline, for example, the language of history, the language of geography, of mathematics, of chemistry, uh, for example, or the knowledge industry, uh, where we need to cover good deal of at least the ideational aspect of the description of a language uh, to get a handle on uh, the construction of knowledge uh, in the ideational semantics. What about theory? Well, examples of theory in, in relation to applicability would be uh, areas where we need the overall organization of the theory, the relational multidimensional organization uh, to explore some activity. Uh, a newly emergent one would be neurosemiotics, as pioneered by Adolfo Garcia and his team. Uh, then you need to understand the organization of language holistically uh, to, to think about how you can relate this to what we know about the organization of the neural organization of the brain, for example. Uh, computational linguistics, where again you have to do explicit modeling. Uh, now on the computer rather than the wetware of the brain, right? Or multisemiotic modeling. Here again, uh, it involves an application of the theory uh, very, very centrally. Uh, let me conclude then just with uh, the, the, the notion of theory applicability. Uh, and one thing I haven't talked about uh, here, but, but in various other places is the theory includes then a theory of what kind of system language is. And the theory says that language is a semiotic system with an ordered typology of systems. It's a fourth order system, systems of meaning. Uh, within such systems, semiotic systems, language is a higher order system with the organizational properties that I've touched on, uh, the multi-semiotic dimensional relational organization, stratification of content into semantics and lexigram, the metafunctional organization and so on. But we also know then uh, that as a semiotic system, language and other semiotic systems are enacted in third order systems, social systems. So I have the properties of the organization of social systems into different role networks. By another step, uh, it's embodied in, in biological systems, in the biological organism, uh, including the brain. And this then is important uh, when we come to the development of neurosemiotics. So if we focused on the higher orders, then uh, what I've suggested is uh, whatever we can say about the higher order semiotic systems in terms of the architecture of language and context uh, can be a powerful guide in different domains of application where we need to move up all the way to the theory. So you have the span from ADA, Appliable Discourse Analysis, all the way up to applications where you need to rely on the general theory of language as a human system. Uh, now let me play you a little bit of pre-recorded uh, conclusion and then I'll say thank you. We've now come to the conclusion of my talk on applied linguistics emerging in the context of the celebration of 50 years at Letras, of Letras. The final point I try to make is if we have a holistic theory and even holistic meta theory that places 
uh, conceptualization and modeling of language and of other semiotic systems in a general order typology of systems, then we are in a good position to think about how to apply the theory to different tasks emerging. And I mentioned just a couple, computational modeling and neurosemiotics, something that has been pursued by a friend and colleague in Argentina, Adolfo Garcia. Now here we need the full power of theory, even the meta theory, to be empowered to apply and that means, for example, in neurosemiotics, to have a way of relating language as a higher order semiotic system to its enactment in social systems, its embodiment in biological systems, including centrally the brain, wherever it is, and finally manifestation in physical systems. That's an exciting new emerging field, one that is technologically enabled through, among other things, new brain scan, scan, scanning techniques. And I hope we'll have other opportunities to talk. I'm always happy to have discussions, listen to comments, take this further. And I look, further, I look forward to uh, the next, if not 50 years of lectures, at least the next uh, decades when I can be around to enjoy the developments and applaud them from a distance. Many thank you. Many thanks. Uh, okay. I think you can stop sharing now. Uh, stop screen, right? Yep. Yes, yes. yes. But just stay yes. here. But just stay put. I, no, yes. I'm he's still here, yes. So, so yes. Uh, what, what, I hope I have not run over time too much. But, but No, no, that's fine. You. That's fine. Uh, also, I mean, thank you very much for this uh, amazing sort of heavy load, sort of heavy loaded <laughs> content presentation. It's really a pleasure. For the people in the audience, we can always watch it again and again, as it will be on the channel on the Eli UFAC channel on YouTube, so you can watch all the presentations. Uh, we have some time for questions. We can just not let you go without some questions. Okay, so we have to keep you for a while. Uh, thank you, Charles. So we have a few questions. We can start. We have one question from our tech guy, uh, Ed Nelson Viana. He's the guy behind all the technology here. So, uh, Professor Christian Madsen, how do you think linguistics can contribute to fighting fake news? Ah, uh, that is, of course, an extremely important question. Uh, I think, in a sense, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, it's hard to go about. It is not so, not so easy, of course. Uh, and it's a phenomenon of our time. Uh, our time is, as it were, a, a bigger version of what happened with the introduction in the West, earlier in China, of removable print, printing, uh, which meant that uh, text, written text, could be distributed in larger quantities, much more widely, much cheaper. Uh, and that was reflected, for example, in the growth of personal libraries over a period of 100 years or so. So explosive. But compared to now, of course, big difference is uh, this, the, this is now exponential. Uh, and so there are so many texts. The flow of text is, is enormous. Uh, we're talking about big data. The challenge, of course, then precisely is to say is quality control. And quality control then includes uh, fake news. Uh, now, we know that there are different uh, fact-checking organizations. The problem is uh, that the volume is far too large to do this manually and we could do certain samples but we really need the tools uh, to automate it uh, we had a project led by john patrick in the mid noughts the scamseek project and the task we were assigned by asic australian securities investment commission uh, was to develop a system that could automate automatically detect at least potential scams 
it's a very similar problem. Uh, scams, fake news, all right? Uh, and what the ASIC had found, the Australian Securities Investment Commission had found was the volume of text was so large that they couldn't manually co check it any longer. What they needed was something that at least showed potential scammers uh, that they could identify potential scams automatically. Uh, then, of course, they can be checked manually. Based on that, uh, could prosecute. Uh, so it's to scare scammers away. Uh, similar with fake news, there will be uh, patterns, uh, sort of syndromes of features that are likely to suggest fake, uh, uh, fake, fakeness. Uh, but they will have to be checked, of course, further. But what we need is something that gives an initial diagnosis and can then be taken further. Uh, I had a very brilliant, a few years ago, a very brilliant fourth-year student at uh, PolyU, where, where Francesco and I were both at the time, uh, Linus Ng. Uh, and he was so upset with the lack of quality in the debate around lead up to the Brexit referendum in the UK, in particular with the fakeness of the people who argued in favor of Brexit, uh, that he looked into the possibility in recordings of, of uh, transcripts of recordings of a few debates uh, to find patterns that would be indicative of a lack of facts. And indeed, he was able to use, I mean, he was able to do this uh, using some tools. Uh, so I think cautiously, yes, uh, but clearly this is something that needs investment and ingenuity. One of the interesting challenges is to bring the people who are experts in computers, AI, information science together with the linguist. So there was a move uh, started around uh, a decade ago, a bit of a decade ago, uh, involving people behind Google Trends uh, and, and such Google initiatives uh, called Culturomics. Uh, and they're certainly brilliant researchers, uh, no linguists. Uh, and the idea was that one should be able to uh, track cultural trends uh, by analyzing large volumes or flow of discourse, Culturomics. So it's an interesting notion. Now, if you can take this and you can take the tremendous resources they have uh, and the computational skills, much, much more than you're likely to find in computational linguistics, right, uh, and put that together uh, with a powerful holistic theory and comprehensive descriptions, uh, this could be extraordinary. But, of course, it's a matter of getting the communities together and it's difficult to, to, uh, to create the conditions for doing this. Uh, but I think what you what you ask uh, is, is your question Ed, is is a vision for a continuing expanding research program, uh, and it's certainly it's tremendously important. The other aspect of of this, uh, in a sense, obviously, I think is it has to go into the educational system, uh, and it has to start early. Uh, it's not enough for university. It's not enough for high school. I think earlier. In other words, uh, we have to empower uh, people to be much more aware of what to look for uh, in terms of scams, in terms of alternative facts, uh, fakeness, in terms of bias, prejudice, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a whole syndrome of things that goes together with the extraordinary volume of text, as I said before, uh, but then also the so-called social media uh, that have been shown to be addictive or potentially very damaging. Again, uh, we need ways of, of detecting this, to alerting, at least advising people. So thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Christian. Uh, this was actually my question, okay, when you, as you were talking, and because I'm always thinking about fake news. So this is actually related to Ed Nelson's uh, question, and in a way you touched that. Uh, and we have been discussing about this. Uh, we have discussed this in other occasions. And I remember last week, somebody here uh, during the event, somebody posted something about uh, what are the challenges, what are the difficulties in doing research in linguistics? Because we only need a computer, a room and a computer. And when I saw that, I was like, 
I thought, okay, this is actually very tricky because other than the things you mentioned, what are other things that other challenges? Because you also have issues with funding. We cannot just do research out by ourselves. So if you want to elaborate on that as well, think about these challenges with big data collaboration and money. Yes, thank you. I mean, it's uh, very interesting. I think it's, it's directly related to, to uh, uh, phenomena like, like culturomics and so on, uh, or a related project by Deb Roy, who, who trained people in this area uh, at, at MIT, uh, a, a um, speech home project that's now started about 15 years ago where he and his wife, when they were about to have their first child, somehow they got the funding to wire up uh, the whole home, which seems to have been a reasonably comfortable, la comfortably large one, uh, with audio video recording everywhere so that they would be able to uh, track uh, their newborn child, the son, uh, all over the house, in principle, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and the notion, and then of course they needed e extraordinary uh, storage capacity uh, because this very quickly over days uh, turns into terabytes upon terabytes. Uh, so they had an extraordinary uh, archive of big data uh, and they tracked, for example, when did this uh, young child begin to approximate something that they interpreted as the word for water. How did it? So they took this over time, and the, the analytical tools are, of course, amazing. Uh, this, I think, like uh, culturomics, is uh, an interesting example of the naive notion that all it takes is a computer. I mean, it's incredibly naive. Uh, and uh, that's, of course, precisely what you get if you come in from below in terms of the technology only, uh, information science, uh, AI, and so on natural language processing, I mean, there's a lot of can be achieved. But what was entirely lacking uh, in their interpretation and that could have guided the further development was any any theory of uh, what learning how to mean is like. So if you could have put this together, this I mean, it must have been so expensive, put this together with Michael Hurley's insights from hiding behind the chairs, uh, pen and paper, taking notes, uh, from 69 uh, onwards in a case study, a longitudinal case study, that would have been explosive, I think. So that's one of the challenges we fi find that uh, putting the technology together with the theory. Now, the theory could take different forms. If you, if you read the history of modern science, the breakthroughs in modern science in Western Eurasia, it's very clear that technology was not enough. And nobody who, who, who reads the studies this would ever think that you could only do it with a computer. You could take the telescope. When Galileo got wind of somebody having developed a telescope in Holland and then on his own constructed one, uh, of course, that went together uh, with uh, semiotic systems he needed. Later on, uh, Newton uh, observation, of course, uh, including instruments for observation, the experimental uh, technique, but he also needed a new form of semiosis. Uh, while he didn't think about it, he needed the uh, early scientific English uh, or Latin, but he also needed to invent a new kind of semiotics, calculus or differential calculus. Uh, and that he needed to express the laws of motion. So it's almost a combination of the two. Uh, now, which comes before, uh, how they influence one another, that's an interesting question. But you need, you need the data, as it were, observed through technology. You need the theory and you need possibly the generalization through technology and so on. But it's a combination of these. Uh, and again, we can see this in linguistics, but I think it's general across different areas of, of study. You, you need these different components. Uh, but in linguistics, you can see the limits of what can be done with uh, a kind of corpus linguistics where the notion is it will only, it would just emerge from the corpus. On the one hand, people don't realize that the construction of the corpus is a theoretical one. So you can't represent a corpus without some theoretical assumptions. 
Uh, on the other hand, when they begin discussing what it is they find, they're already into the domain of theory. Uh, and there was a paper that Chris Nesbitt and I wrote uh, many years ago, a quarter of a century, you know, yeah, uh, you know, uh, about the, the uh, naive notion of, of theory and mutual uh, research. And that, that's just an illusion. Uh, and you, you, you may be persuaded by that illusion if you don't have a meta theory that allows you to see what choices you already make when you claim that it's theory neutral. So the combinations of objectives are very interesting. I, I think one, one, one important step forward would be to get much more dialogue. Uh, and if we, can, if we can educate students who buy or multi meta uh, that would be very, very helpful. So often with scholars who have already been uh, formed, uh, like myself, uh, the best we can do is talk to scholars from other areas of, of uh, expertise. And that is, of course, important. Uh, but uh, new research students can grow up, as I said, by metalingual, meta uh, in linguistics, in information science, in linguistics, in neuroscience. Uh, and... Uh, that, I think, is an important part of the way forward. Uh, as an example, uh, we can see what happened in educational linguistics. Uh, the tremendous contribution made by educators who went back to the university to do a PhD in linguistics and system functional linguistics. So within one person, uh, you have these areas of expertise. And that means that they can play a very important role in multidisciplinary teams. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could go on with this discussion for a long time, of course, but we have limited time. And we have one last question uh, from Jacqueline Andreucci Lindstrom. What's the place of the theory of complexity in this context? Ah, fascinating. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, the very last uh, thing I showed, the sort of ordered uh, typology of systems. That, of course, relates directly to uh, some kind of theory of complexity. Uh, I mean, there have been different theories uh, since the 40s, uh, at least, coming from different disciplines. Uh, and uh, they uh, are all worth considering. I think from the point of view of uh, what I showed you with this order typology, it's an invitation uh, to think about complexity across the systemic orders. Uh, so there's been a dominant theme in linguistics, uh, thanks to or because of Chomsky, has been in, in some sense, even though he refers to computational systems mechanisms, to insulate lingu language from other systems. But in systemic functional linguistics, what one like to try to do is see what are general principles, general systemic com principles, say for emerging complexity, increasing complexity, uh, that are manifested in different systems. So it's a kind of notion that you have certain systemic organizational principles that are fract like fractals. They're manifested in different environments. Mm -hmm. So you can think, for example, about composition. We see that this... Uh, is, is something that emerges with greater complexity of systems uh, in different orders, physical systems, biological systems, social systems, uh, and semiotic systems. Uh, the interesting question then is, what are the principles that are shared across systems, and what are the new uh, principles of organization that emerge with the system of a new order? So with social systems, it's what one aspect that's new is precisely the sort of one individual taking on different roles in different role networks. So you're no longer simply one organism, uh, right? But you become an organism in different roles in different networks. And we can see that people need to sort this out in, in, in all the debate about gender and sex, for example. It's so central to this, uh, to, to realize that one organism can be fluid, but it can also play different roles, also semiotically. Uh, and so role networks, and then when we go to semiotic systems, so stratification, so both content expression and so on. Uh, so I, I would say this is very much what we can uh, hope to draw on from, from uh, general systems theory, from, system of comp uh, from theories of complex systems, emerging complexity. So uh, Luke Steele, for example, he's talked about 
level formation uh, in respect to language. And he's applied this to his version of construction grammar. But I think this is very resonant with uh, empirical work in SFL, including the work on learning how to mean on language development. So kind of gradual complexity. Uh, so I think that's 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 fascinating and and very important for moving forward. So I appreciate that that question. So uh, one can look, for example, at a particular manifestation like the work that's been done at the Santa Fe Institute for the study of complex adaptive systems. Uh, one of the founders was Murray Gelman, a physicist. He passed away within the last year or so. Uh, and he wrote a book, a sort of popular science book on, on complex systems, complex adaptive systems, the, the quark and the, and the jaguar. Uh, but there have been different contributors. And of course, this found its way into applied linguistics uh, in, in, in an attempt to adapt it. But what you need, as it were, is you need this, uh, and then you need a kind of linguistic theory that is resonant with it, ready to talk to it, as it were. Uh, and surprisingly, I would suggest the semi-systemic functional linguistics is it. That is a kind of linguistic theory. Because it's dedicated to holistic theory and comprehensive descriptions, uh, it's absolutely placed in a good a dialogic position for dialoguing with with uh, theories of complex systems, complex adaptive systems, emergence, and so on. And so, uh, so Diane Larson Friedman, she's, she's pushed this uh, complex adaptive theory in applied linguistics, uh, and it's great. But uh, where is the linguistic theory? Well, SFL could be it. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. We have one last question, just came up, another question from Enochia Piatico. Uh, actually, I was just introduced uh, to Enoch uh, by Christian. Uh, he is from Ghana. Oh, We have some people right. here from Ghana, so that's very good. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Enoch. Thank you, Professor Madsen, for this insightful talk. I was wondering how the multifaceted broad view of linguistics would be integrated in the framing of emerging language departments? Ah. Uh, Politics. <laughs> yes, and, and, and institutional uh, work. Uh, I, think, I think this is, uh, uh, it's, it's very important. If you think about the histories of different linguistic departments and the way in the 60s, uh, you know, when many new linguistic departments were formed, in a sense, as part of the expansion of tertiary education, baby boomers, but also the increase in the percentage of the population who went beyond secondary school. Uh, and that meant that there were there were there was money for many new linguistics departments. I mean, it's not the same all over the world in certain parts, uh, richer parts. Uh, and because of the, it happened to be uh, at the same time as the beginning of the Chomskyan linguistic domination of linguistics, uh, many of these positions were filled by Chomskyans of one ilk or another. Now you can then look at, if you talk about 20, 50 years old, you can then look at when they began to retire and what happened to the departments or what happened to if they folded, which happened, because uh, they weren't uh, oriented towards social accountability, towards knowledge transfer, uh, towards impact, positive impact in society, right? They were inward looking. Uh, or if they were replaced, what happened? Uh, if one has the chance to, to guide an emerging language department, uh, I think your question is very central. Of course, uh, we'd, we'd want to consider what are the possibilities, what are the possible orientations. But if it's one uh, that has as part of its agenda to provide students with a sense of applicable linguistics, uh, then I think very important, it should be such that it's not just a smorgasbord or a buffet of courses that often tends to happen, but there should be some thinking about the progression. So increasing mastery of skills in different areas. Uh, and that could be organized uh, around different themes. It could even be registers, although that may be more uh, sensible in language department. But uh, so you need this through through a sort of curriculum that has built in prerequisites, of course. I think the way you start the first year, and this is something I learned from Michael Halliday, 
many, many years ago. He said the tendency in linguistics department in the first year is to teach the students about linguistics. Uh, and he said in the first year, you, you shouldn't teach them about linguistics, you should teach them about language. <laughs> now, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant that language is, as it were, so central to our lives, uh, and, but it's background. So it should be an invitation to students to uh, learn to observe language, to learn to reflect on language. Uh, and you can use different different methods. I like the notion of phonetic yoga. When you discover your body in terms of uh, articulatory potential beyond what has been as a were phonologized in the language you know, but also auditory, you need to you learn to observe uh, and it, and differentiate sounds you're not familiar with. Uh, but also more on the content plane, say discourse diaries. You just keep track, say on through a day or a week, of the texts in different registers in different contexts they engage in in speaking writing uh different semiotic systems and that begins to give you a sense of uh life made out of semiosis as it were so if you can achieve that in the first year then you really have something to build on then gradually you can teach about linguistics uh but on the whole i would say but people would argue in an undergraduate program you want to make sure uh, that you give the students the knowledge, expertise, and the skills they need so that when they graduate, they can actually be functional linguists linguist. or functional linguists. I mean, linguists become function in society in different roles, attracted to employers. And that includes discourse analysis, of course. Uh, uh, and I think that's very important. Then they may go on to do uh, graduate MA, PhD studies. But it seems to me if we can if we can develop this notion of linguists as a profession uh, that is highly valuable in different institutions, the community, that would be one way of orienting uh, emerging linguistics programs, not uh, to train students so that they can be successful in getting into US or European uh, PhD programs and then stay within the academic scenes only, right? So there are so many problems in a community that can actually be addressed uh, uh, through language in one way or another. Uh, I think that's an important contribution that an emerging linguistics de department could make. Um, I don't know if that's too abstract or too, too general as an answer, but uh, it's, it's, it's uh, one way of thinking about it. Okay, thank you, Christian. One last question that came up, I don't think we should leave it unanswered, especially because, I mean, it, it's a rare opportunity to have Christian with us. So, uh, Josh Ms. Lima, he asked, uh, what is the relationship between education linguistics and applied linguistics? How do you ah. see this difference? Very interesting question. I mean, you could say applied linguistics is essentially something that uh, I mean, it was done before the 60s, but it emerged as something that was increasingly separate from theoretical linguistics starting in the 60s onwards. If, if you look at the topics that were included in applied linguistics, you see that they've changed uh, fairly significantly over the decades. Uh, so, for example, uh, machine translation, translation studies were part of applied linguistics in the 60s. Uh, say work, uh, professional discourse, uh, workplace uh, studies and so on came in much later when these had left. Uh, and it's a typical pattern of when something gets critical mass, it may actually be, be uh, hived off and, and given its own, uh, in, its in, in own institutional existence, as it were. Uh, but of course, you could say that language and education was part of, of applied linguistics from the start. Uh, according to Spolsky, uh, Bernard Spolsky, he named it in the six, in the seventies, uh, educational linguistics. Uh, but I've looked at this in terms of using, uh, you know, Google, Google trends and so on. And I actually find instances or in the sixties, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think by the second half of the 80s, so educational linguistics uh, was, of course, something that was 
already had character uh, on its own, but uh, probably it's an inclusive relationship. So educational linguistics is a subset of applied linguistics. Then you get the additional uh, complication of fashions. Uh, it seems to me as somebody who is, I would say, a support person, a resource person for applied linguistics, but but more of a descriptive theoretical linguist by, by training and inclination, that applied linguistics, Chomsky's fashions notwithstanding, or generative fashions, has been fairly fashion driven. Uh, and so you jump from one, one fashion to another. Uh, you see this, of course, in approaches to second foreign language teaching, uh, the su su succession of different fashions uh, rather than accumulation. Uh, so when we think about the relationship with educational linguistics, educational linguistics and applied linguistics, that's another aspect. So applied linguistics uh, gone through different fashions. Now in uh, second foreign language teaching, a current fashion seems to be motivation. Uh, so, the coming from psychology, Dernier, people like Dernier, uh, oh, it's all about motivation of language. And, and the big elephant in the room uh, that remains invisible is, of course, language. Uh, so, it's, it, it seems to be a motif in translation studies, in, in second foreign language teaching and so on. The hard problem uh, you're trying to avoid, and what's the hard problem? Well, that's the engagement with language. So it's easier to talk about motivation. It's not that that's irrelevant, but it's just a question of to what extent uh, does the phenomenon that actually constitutes the center of whatever we're doing, uh, to what extent is a given attention language? So if you if you talk about motivation, immediately you have to start to think in 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 language education, second form. Well, okay, we're not talking about tenor. Uh, if we're talking about tenor, it's not just the individual. Right, it's not just a cognitive, emo emotive psychology approach. It's individual in some tenor relationship, different tenor relationships. That's part of the picture, but there are other aspects to tenor, and there are different as other aspects to the field, uh, to the context in which language learners operate. So I think it does help to have uh, comprehensive maps where we can locate these different contributions and see where they make a contribution, how we can uh, complement them. Okay, thank you very much. I think we ran out of questions. Uh, thank you very much <laughs> everyone for uh, attending, for posting questions. Uh, before we go, I just hold, uh, I just ask you to hang in there for just a little more. Uh, we are just about, we are moving uh, towards uh, our closing session and of course, uh, we cannot go without actually thanking some of the people who have made this possible in, in different ways. Uh, the University of uh, the Universidade Federal do Acre, the Federal University of Acre, UFAC, uh, first of all, for uh, for having been working on this uh, undergraduate program for 50 years, for enduring it. Uh, during this time, so many people have come and go, and they have played uh, a very important role. When an anecdote, Christian loves anecdotes. Uh, and one of my favorite anecdotes about UFAC is that uh, I've written to him about this. Is In 1991, I was uh, 19 to 20, and I started my degree in letters and against my mother's will to study law. And... In the first year, first semester, I attend Linguistics 1, and it was mind-blowing. Uh, the, the lecture was Miss Lucilia Taha, and she was this very tall woman, blonde, very strong, powerful voice, uh, and she was walking from one side to the other in the classroom, and everybody was literally scared of her, of linguistics. And I was fascinated. And I would tell my friends, if I ever do anything, this Enfield thing that they call, I did, I barely knew about what an Enfield was, let alone a PhD then. And then I told my friends, 
I, I might study that. One day she comes in only one class. She comes up with this perfume advertisement on the board and she starts explaining and analyzing the perfume advertisement. And she was using uh, Roland Barthes, uh, the French, uh, to analyze it. And uh, then again, I told my friends, oh, more specifically, I'm going to do this thing called semiotics. And what I learned from that experience was how uh, we as teachers, as professors, we inspire people. And this is one of the aims of this uh, talk here is that we get the audience to be exposed to different approaches, to different topics, to different scholars, but to be inspired to pursue and to continue with, with this wonderful work that needs to be done. Uh, I usually tell my students that in the end, linguistics at the very top of the food chain in science in general, there is no society without uh, language. I remember back in Bologna, I was teaching and I asked uh, the students, okay, so what there is, what is their outside language? Just imagine uh the word without language without communication and if there was this silence some people tried to feel answers and i came up with this the zoo this would just be a zoo we would be part of a big zoo with no social organization so the social world uh what we understand as society only exists because of language in the first place because it, it gives us uh, we create meanings with this, so uh, we should work towards that and further develop our understanding of language in society. I would like to invite now uh, Dr. Grace Godelik to join us. Uh, she is the director for the Teaching and Learning Office at the uh, Federal University of Acre. And she's representing the, the vice president, the, the vice president for undergraduate studies. She can't be here today, the vice president. But then, Dr. Grace Godelik Cabral will be uh, with us to uh, share a few words from the vice pre presidency. Uh, Grace, uh, this is Grace. Pode, uh, Jean bon. Now I have to switch codes. I'm sorry. Então, uh, eu gostaria de convidar agora a, a doutora Grace Godelic Cabral, que está nos representando hoje, está representando a pró-reitura de graduação, doutora Edna Celida Macena, e nós agradecemos a disponibilidade da doutora Grace Godelic por estar aqui e apreciar esse último dia do evento. Uh, a senhora tem a palavra. Tá bom. Bom dia a todos e a todas, né, diferentemente, eu estava aqui nos bastidores conversando com uma colega e falando exatamente sobre isso, né, tudo que eu vi e ouvi até agora, eu ouvi na língua inglesa, né, inclusive observei aí no chat, porque eu estava também ouvindo diretamente lá no YouTube, e aí eu disse assim, eu acho que eu vou me sentir um ET, né, na hora que eu entrar aqui, porque acho que os alunos já estão aí tão acostumados né, com o que estão ouvindo, é, que talvez eu não, não, não faça nem sentido né, a minha fala em língua portuguesa, mas eu peço desculpas, né, não tenho como é, me comunicar com vocês na língua inglesa, mas gostaria que, se fosse possível, né, o professor Osvanilson, é, em especial esse agradecimento, pudesse... É, me intermediar aí. Gostaríamos de agradecer demais a presença do professor Christian, em nome da Pró-Reitoria de Graduação, em nome da professora Edna Celi, que não pôde estar aqui conosco neste momento, é, em função de estar com a agenda batendo, nesse mesmo momento ela está realizando é, atividade com todos os coordenadores para aprovação do calendário 
do segundo semestre de 2021, que vai acontecer no primeiro semestre de 2022, né? Mas, então, nós gostaríamos de começar a nossa fala agradecendo o professor Christian a, 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 a disponibilidade dele de estar com a Universidade Federal do Acre, de estar com o um curso de inglês, professores, alunos e técnicos do curso, nesse momento tão importante. Professor Christian, o curso, talvez é, ele já tenha dito isso em outro momento, mas o curso né, tem muito a comemorar. São 50 anos do curso de inglês na região amazônica, né, no sul na, da Amazônia Ocidental, mas mais especificamente, eu particularmente gosto de dizer que nós estamos na porção é, oeste do Brasil, né, é, no extremo. Ou seja, estamos aqui na divisa com a Amazônia peruana, na divisa com a Amazônia é, boliviana, e é nesse contexto que a Universidade Federal do Acre tem a sua inserção. Né? O curso começou, foi aprovado na Universidade Federal do Acre em 1970, em 1971 o curso começa a formação é, mas em dupla habilitação, ou seja, trabalhava a língua portuguesa, a formação de professores para a língua portuguesa e também para a língua inglesa. Isso em 1971. Em 1973, o curso deu um passo importantíssimo. O curso, olha, em 1973, o Acre, né, tinha aí, era um estado jovem, né? É, considerando que nós alcançamos a autonomia como Estado em 1962. Então, quer dizer, nós ainda éramos infantes, né? digamos assim, na universidade. E aí o curso começa a levar o curso de inglês, a universidade começa a levar o curso de inglês para o interior e na modalidade de licenciatura parcelada. Em 1987, quer dizer, na década seguinte, né, 14, 15 anos depois, o curso de inglês vai ser separado do curso de letras. E ele vai ser o curso de letras inglês. Né, separando a formação, mas aí mantendo a parte administrativa do curso de inglês, do curso de língua portuguesa, do curso de letras francês e letras espanhol, no mesmo locus. Então, dividiu-se pedagogicamente a formação, mas manteve-se a administração dos cursos conjunta. E isso trouxe, de certa forma, um prejuízo para a constituição da identidade do curso de inglês e das outras línguas também. Em 1989, o curso vai ser levado para Cruzeiro do Sul, que é o nosso segundo maior município, e que na década seguinte vai se transformar em campus né? é, da Universidade Federal do Acre. Em 2000, o curso de, é, de letras inglês ele vai estabelecer um outro modelo de formação. Ele vai fazer... Ele é o curso de letras em inglês e ele vai fazer um caminho inverso ao que tinha feito na década anterior. Ou seja, ele vai instituir a complementação em língua portuguesa. Então, ele vai formar né, o professor de inglês e vai complementar a essa formação para que o professor possa também atuar em língua portuguesa. E só... Somente em 2011 o curso vai passar por uma nova organização e dessa vez administrativa e pedagógica e o curso vai ser desmembrado administrativamente dos outros cursos de licenciatura. E só, desculpa, e somente em 2012 o curso vai então receber o, a portaria de reconhecimento é, do MEC, né? instituída pelo INEP. Então, nós gostaríamos de parabenizar né? o curso de letras em inglês, parabenizar cada professor, parabenizar cada aluno egresso desse curso em toda a sua trajetória 
e especialmente os alunos que estão ainda né, em formação, gostaríamos de agradecer e parabenizar né, os organizadores desse importante evento, né, que recebeu pessoas tão importantes, colaboradores tão fantásticos, nesse momento em que vocês estão festejando aí os 50 anos. E dizer né, que nós parabenizamos, sabemos que temos limites, mas temos muito a festejar, a parabenizar né, a linha que o curso tem adotado, especialmente a partir da sua última identidade. Né? Um curso que tem pensado na dimensão pedagógica, uma formação crítica, numa perspectiva dialética, numa perspectiva dialógica, né, de inter-relação com os alunos e com aqueles que estão no entorno, e inclusive com essa possibilidade de internacionalização da, da universidade, trazendo, trazendo é, professores de renome de outras instituições. Um dia desse, conversando com o professor Francisco, ele me dizia da alegria né, de ter o professor Christian conosco neste momento. Ele diz, são anos que eu penso na possibilidade de ter o professor conosco contribuindo com o curso. Né? E ainda bem que esse dia chegou, viu, professor Christian? Ainda bem que o senhor está conosco hoje. Gostaria de dizer que nessa concepção de curso hoje, nós temos, né, estamos vivenciando aí a possibilidade de termos, pelo menos no documento de identidade do curso, né, uma perspectiva de língua inglesa como um fenômeno social, marcado pela interação discursiva, através daquilo que o grupo né, de professores de inglês entendem como enunciação da língua, né? é fundada numa abordagem intercultural que concebe a diferença né? é, é, linguística como um valor antropológico. Então, eu me sinto nesse aspecto confortável, né? embora eu não seja é, falante da língua inglesa, né? consigo aí talvez fazer uma rápida tradução de um texto na minha área, mas não sou falante da língua inglesa mas entendo que esses que estão me ouvindo agora concebem essa diferença como um valor antropológico, como um valor que pode enriquecer a nossa, o nosso diálogo e a nossa mediação aqui. É, vejo também no PPC do curso uma busca é, é, é incessante né? e constante da superação da visão da língua inglesa eurocêntrica, colonizadora, né? trabalhando, trabalhando a língua como uma prática social, contextualizada, flexível e, mais do que tudo, decolonizadora. Né? É, eu acho que isso é um ganho para a nossa universidade e é um ganho para os estudantes que entraram nessa estrutura curricular a partir de 2019. Compreendendo o aprendizado e a apropriação da língua inglesa, Nessa perspectiva contemporânea de que se apropriar da língua ou estar nesse espaço né, em que se apropria da língua, esse espaço se torna um espaço de saber e também um espaço de poder, a partir de uma nova lógica, né, que não é do centro para a periferia, mas é daqueles que estão na periferia sendo atraídos pelo centro, fundado numa prática é pedagógica e numa prática é social crítica, né? aquilo que os teóricos da minha área anunciam, numa prática crítica, numa, pré, numa prática humana, numa prática ética e que prioriza a transculturalidade da língua. Nós estamos aqui em região, professor, que nós temos inclusive indígenas, né? muitos indígenas, e muitos indígenas fazendo cursos de letras. Então, essa transculturalidade para nós ela é muito cara, né? especialmente para nós que estamos é, é, em cursos que estão situados aí na Amazônia. Então, é, parabéns ao curso, né? eu deixo aqui uma mensagem de apreço né? por cada professor que tem aí vestido a camisa do curso, 
por cada aluno que tem acreditado nessa formação, ao pouco ou muito incentivo, mas sempre presente, um incentivo institucional para o fortalecimento dos nossos cursos. Então, querido Oswanilson, um abraço, né? abraçando você, eu quero dizer que estou abraçando cada professor do curso e, especialmente, abraçando o nosso querido professor Christian nessa manhã. E que venham os próximos 50 anos né, com outros registros lindos aí dessa trajetória formativa do curso. Tá? Um abraço em cada um de vocês e o desejo de muito sucesso nessa caminhada. Obrigada, viu? Obrigado também, professora Grace. Uh, professora Grace just highlighted Uh, how the program was uh, approved by the federal government and implemented in 1970. And just to put a little bit of context in that, uh, the state of Acre is the western uh, state in Brazil. So we are, we are way to the left of Brazil with the border with Bolivia and Peru. And actually, this piece of land didn't belong to Brazil until 1906, I think. Now, if I recall uh, 1906, and we only became a state, it was a territory, until 1972, so we, it, there was very limited power uh, in terms of administration to, the, to this piece of land. And so the program was implemented in 1972 and we only became a state, sorry, 1970, 1972, we become a state. And then we start expanding the university and the programs to the smaller cities. But then if we consider the region, uh, the state of Acre is larger than Portugal and Portugal has around 10 million people. And this piece of land, which is larger, has less than a million people today. So we have probably around 800 people in a place larger than Portugal. It's a lot of forest. It's a, it's a beautiful place to fly over. It's, it's a sea of uh, forest that we need to make sure is not destroyed. It's a challenge. So we have been working a lot with discussion. We have been having discussions with other universities in the Amazon uh, in the Amazon area so that we actually can develop more uh, collaboration and then work together to solve our own problems, problems related to this region. So in 1973, uh, we start between 72, 73, start taking these programs to the heartlands of the state. In 1987, Uh, so the, the program was English Portuguese, it was a double degree, and only 1987 uh, they divorced and then it, they became separated programs. And over the years, it has been updated with the latest uh, update to the curriculum being 2019, uh, when uh, it was adopted uh, a curriculum with the idea of the English, English language as a social practice, but also as lingua franca, uh, and the process of decolonizing uh, of knowledge, so we can actually move towards producing our own knowledge, and not just be reproducers of knowledge. So we are trying to appropriate of space, of knowledge, and power to create uh, a new logic, and of course, in, uh, improve education in this area that we face so many challenges. Uh, among many others, it was very funny, interesting. Uh, when, I, when I left here for my MPhil, when I applied for the MPhil, I felt a little bit weird because somebody in the examining board asks me, where did you learn English? And it was Odd. It was almost odd to have someone from here at the time, but I'm very happy that we have been, we have gone a, a long way with the core, uh, with the program, and we have developed uh, in very, very uh, positive ways and opened opportunities to people here, including myself and Dr. Grace Godelip and many other people. So we thank Prof. Uh, Dr. Grace Godelip for being with us today. I would like to invite next 
Dr. Lisandro Juno. He's from a completely different field. He's from biology. And he is here representing the vice president for research and postgraduate studies. He's the man, they are the people of funding, of money, uh, research money. So I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Lisandro Juno for being with us. And he would like to share a few words on behalf of Professor uh, Margarida Carvalho, who could not attend this session today. Thank you very much, Dr. Lisandro. The floor is yours. Bom dia, professor Osvaldo Nilson, professor Christian. É, em primeiro lugar, eu queria agradecer o convite, né, para representar aqui a professora e o convite feito para a Propeg. É, essa área de língua inglesa é extremamente importante, não só para ensino, mas para pesquisa é fundamental. Né? Eu vou proferir algumas palavras que a professora pediu em nome dela. E o professor Zuanius vai traduzir, porque o inglês está muito enferrujado para poder falar fluentemente aqui. Uh, he will uh, read a statement uh, prepared by Dr. Uh, professor Mar Margarida Cavalho, vice president, and I will translate by paragraph to make it uh, easier. Ok. Então, bom dia, boa tarde a todos. Em nome da professora Margarida Cavalho, reitora de pesquisa e pós-graduação, Cumprimento e parabenizo a organização do evento, nas pessoas do professor Francisco Veloso e da professora Maísa Dourado, também aos colaboradores, palestrantes e o Centro de Estudos Linguísticos e Culturais da Universidade de Bolonha. É, especialmente ao professor Christian, nesse momento, que acabou de proferir uma excelente palestra, nos trouxe informações muito interessantes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So, on behalf of... Uh the Vice Presidency for Research and uh, Postgraduate Studies, Professor Mar Margarida Carvalho, would like to congratulate the organization of this event, to, to Dr. Francisco Veloso, me, and Dr. Maísa Dourado, who have worked, organized this event, along with the collaboration of CHESLI, uh, Centro de Estudos Linguísticos e Culturais, uh, the Center for Linguistic Studies and Culture from the University of Bologna, Thank you very much. Uh, merece é, especial parabéns o curso de letras da UFAC, que em seus 50 anos de existência vem trazendo grandes benefícios à sociedade regional por meio da formação de profissionais que têm sua atuação em vários campos, em particular na rede de ensino, cuja história deve ter sido amplamente abordada neste evento, que é além de acadêmico científico, também comemorativo. Special attention to the and congratulations to the uh, pro, to the Letras program for its 50 years, as it had brought uh, many benefits to the region through the formation of language professionals uh, acting, working different fields, especially in teaching, uh, with a history that certainly has been uh, touched upon during this uh, scientific academic uh, event. O tema do evento, ele foca sobre estudos linguísticos em inglês, uma língua de significativa importância para a ciência, dado que é a mais utilizada no meio internacional e é a língua que facilita a comunicação comercial, acadêmica e científica entre povos de origens e línguas diferentes. Os debates aqui ocorridos focaram sobre aspectos importantes para o desenvolvimento da área, tais como letramentos em estudo de inglês, multimodalidade, métodos de análise eh, linguística quantitativa e qualitativa, a difusão da língua inglesa e seus impactos em políticas locais e educacionais, e uma análise temporal da pesquisa e suas perspectivas teóricas atuais e os desafios que o profissional da linguagem deverá enfrentar nos próximos anos. Uh, the, the, the themes that this event has touched upon on linguistic studies in English, uh, they have focused on important aspects to the development of the area, such as uh, literacies in English studies, multimodality, methods in linguistic 
analysis, both quantitative and qualitative, the, the spread of the English language and its impact in local and educational policies, and an analysis of temporal research and its uh, theoretical perspectives in contemporary society, and also the challenges that language professions that we have to face in the coming years. A UFAC, ela tem contribuído para a área de linguística através de programas de pós-graduação em letras. Temos atualmente dois programas, Linguagem e Identidade e Ensino de Linguagens e Humanidades, cada qual com seus alvos de pesquisa e ensino específicos, mas que devem, é, que tem levado à visibilidade dos estudos, dos estudos linguísticos e tem aberto a perspectiva do desenvolvimento de outras iniciativas sobre temas ainda não incorporados, alguns deles tratados durante esse ciclo de palestras. Uh, the UF, UFAC uh, has uh, contributed to the advancement of the area, not only linguistics, but also literary studies, uh, language at large, through two uh, postgraduate programs. Uh, the first one was language and identity, letras, language and identity, and the second one uh, opened, uh, implemented more recently, is the teaching of languages and humanities, which is, uh, just to add to what uh, Dr. Uh, Lisandro Juno said, is that not only English is looked at in these two programs, but also uh, Portuguese and other languages, including indigenous languages, that we have many groups here in the state, so there is a concern related to how we develop knowledge regarding indigenous languages and how to keep them alive, how to contribute to these groups. As tecnologias e meios embarcados no mundo da internet têm trazido rápidas e contínuas mudanças na forma de como as pessoas lidam com a comunicação e com a linguagem e com a fragilidade da verdade, da verdade que está embutida na comunicação, em especial nas mídias sociais. Esse fenômeno de escala mundial tem sido usado tanto para o bem quanto para o mal, merecendo especial atenção dos pesquisadores da área. Uh, new technologies, they have changed the world uh, and has been bringing all these changes in the way we handle the way we interact with communication, how we communicate, and how we use lang uh, language per se. Uh, and in this context, we have this uh, sort of fragility of truth embedded in the process of communication. Actually, this is just what we were talking about before, fake news in contemporary society. So it needs uh, special attention to, to our area of linguistics. No Brasil, nas últimas décadas, em meio a tantas mudanças nas políticas de investimentos em pesquisa, quando é clara uma diminuição relativa do investimento nas áreas de ciências humanas, que afetam diretamente pesquisas em estudos linguísticos, curiosamente na contramão do desenvolvimento que se deu nessas áreas a partir do início dos anos 2000, quando passaram a desenvolver novos métodos analíticos e a utilizarem ferramentas computacionais e acesso a tecnologias de acesso virtual em franca evolução para avanços em pesquisa e ensino. Yeah, we have faced in Brazil the challenges in terms of funding, research funding, uh, as it has been, we have been having cuts on research fund consistently through the years, uh, especially in opposition to what happened uh, since the early 2000s, when with the development of Web 2.0, uh, we have uh, created all these new ways of communicating and social media became a great, uh, a big player on the internet. And at the same time, we are also facing now all these cuts after we, ha we have had a period of what, where we had much more funding and now we are trying to adjust uh, to this new reality of having more demand for linguistic studies, but at the same time, uh, less funding, which makes it even more challenging. 
É, eu entendo que há necessidade da adoção de ações que garantam o desenvolvimento das pesquisas sobre linguagens com base na modernização dos meios de pesquisa e ampliação da utilização de ferramentas computacionais, bases de dados digitais, métodos analíticos modernos, estabelecimento de pesquisa em redes de grande envergadura e capacitação contínua dos pesquisadores, além da ampla divulgação e esclarecimento da sociedade sobre os atuais processos e estratégias de comunicação presentes no meios virtuais, de forma que se possa garantir o desenvolvimento da área e aumentar a chance de captação de recursos para a pesquisa. I, un I understand the need for uh, adopting actions that could uh, allow to develop for the research on language uh, with developing new uh, research, mo modern research resources, uh, enlarging the use of computational tools like investing more in computational linguistics, uh, data, digital data banks, methods, uh, modern analytical methods, and the implementation of a large scale uh, research network. Uh, besides the, the, I'm sorry, it's not easy. Uh, besides the, advertising more to society and uh, sort of in, in light society in terms of the actual process strategies in communication found in virtual, in digital communication, which is again, go back to fake news. We need to understand more about fake news, its language and structure so that we can tell people so you don't read this, you don't believe this. So we need to have closer uh, contact. We need to be more uh, in contact with society to bring this knowledge, transform, uh, we transfer knowledge to society in more effective ways, in a way that we can actually guarantee the development of the area and improve uh, the chances of getting more funding, research funding, okay? Por fim, considerando a grande importância da área de linguística e os vastos horizontes que se descortinam, haja vista o caráter estruturante da linguagem em todos os aspectos da vida em sociedade, gostaria de provocar os pesquisadores a se mobilizarem em prol da modernização e desenvolvimento da pesquisa e pós-graduação na área, buscando capacitação contínua, participação nos programas de pós-graduação e a ampliação das redes de cooperação em pesquisa e ensino em nível nacional e internacional. O desenvolvimento de vacinas contra a Covid pode ser, talvez, o melhor exemplo de como cooperação em pesquisa pode trazer benefícios para a sociedade. Finally, considering the great importance of linguistics and the, the challenges that we have ahead, uh, considering the 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 structural importance of language in the way it organizes society as i told you we are on the top of the food chain in science uh we need to uh he urges the researchers uh to work towards the modernization and the development of research both uh at postgraduate level uh of searching, trying to get more uh, funding and improving our knowledge uh, with continuous education, uh, joining postgraduate programs and uh, investing in creating a larger network of research cooperation at national and international level. The development of, a vaccine, of vaccines against COVID-19 might be uh the best example we have today of how uh research cooperation in research can bring benefits to society é por fim eu espero que o evento que ora se encerra tenha injetado ânimo nos senhores e senhoras para resistirem às dificuldades operacionais e ampliar a produção científica e a formação de profissionais de alto nível a fim de que a sociedade tenha vultosos benefícios né os desafios são enormes e numerosos, 
e o Brasil uh, tem grandes desafios no desenvolvimento da ciência como um todo, e a área, especialmente aqui na Universidade Federal do Acre, uma universidade relativamente nova, também tem desafios gigantescos. Né? Nós somos gratos, então, pela presença de todos no evento e desejamos a todos uma excelente semana. Thank you. Uh, I hope that this event that ends now has sort of uh, injected uh, more energy in all of us. It did to me. Thank you. Uh, to resist the operational challenges, difficulties, and to to uh, enlarge, to work more towards uh, more scientific production and to the formation of professionals of, at a high level professionals and that it may have a good a positive large impact in society uh, the challenges they are numerous they are enormous uh, but we need to stand so we are thankful for your presence to this event thank you everyone who's been standing here until now uh, and Thank you very much, Dr. Lisandro Dr. Lisandro Junior uh, Juno and Dr. Grace Godelip for coming here. And just before finishing, I swear to God, this is the last one. Uh, I would like to thank every person who helped to make this uh, possible. Uh, the Cheslik, the research group from the University of Bologna, was a great uh, asset helping us to publicize the event in Italy, across Italy and Europe. We had students here. I also sent this invitation to Hong Kong and other places. So we have had students registered here, people registered here from Italy, from Hong Kong. Today we have people from Ghana. So this is something that we are aiming at, not to be limited by borders, but to really work towards these international robust international net research network. I would like to read a few words, Dr. Professor Anna Pano. She's the leader of Cheslik, University of Bologna. Uh, she sent me uh, this message and I'll, I would like to share it with you today. I apologize for not being with you in this closing session of the Letters at 50 International Conference. And I very much thank Francisco Veloso who say a few words on behalf of the Cheslik Centro de Estudio Linguístico Cultural of the Modern Languages Department at the University of Bologna. It has been a pleasure and an honor collaborating with this event, which constitutes an excellent way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Letras at the Letras program at the Federal University of Acre. I have been able to follow a couple of the conferences of the talks and I've had the occasion to see that this has also been a great occasion to exchange ideas with outstanding scholars and to discuss on the past, present, and especially future of linguistic studies in English in Brazil, but also in other countries. Indeed, as the talks have widely shown, the challenges that arise in teaching and doing research in English studies are numerous and exciting. I am thinking of multimodality, of academic and digital literacies, of interdisciplinary corpus-based approaches, and of uh, global education uh, or global education policies, to mention only a few paths of future, of future prospects, in Professor Madsen's words. Since its foundation, the Cheslik aims at contributing on research and teaching development in these fields, working on specialized discourses on mass media and digital media communication, on contrastive linguistics, corpus linguistics, and translation studies, on new technologies applied to language learning and assessment, and on multi multilingualism and multiculturalism. Co currently, our focus is on social media interaction, multimodality, and linguistic varieties. For example, the so-called new Englishes, issues that call into question our methods of investigation and challenge us as teachers of language and linguistics. No doubt, we share many interests and views with the program, uh, the Letras program, and that's why we are very happy to be here to celebrate with you its 50th anniversary and to get excellent food for thought 
in order to undertake new common projects. On behalf of the CHESLIC, I thank you for organizing this event and hope that we will meet each other soon, hopefully in presence. So do I. Many thanks for your attention and long life to Letras at UFAC. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, those from, uh, if Don is still here, please send uh, our uh, thank, a big thank you uh, for this very uh, gentle, very nice message, encouraging message. On behalf of the program, the extension program for language and literary studies from the Federal University of Acre, I would like to thank uh, on behalf of the whole team, Dr. Maisa Dourado, Dr. Patricia Marov, uh, Mr. Rogério Mendonça for working for the, towards this event. Uh, we have some people here in the background. Uh, Ed Nelson Viana, Ed is the support, the tech guy who created this uh, StreamYard uh, page so we can broadcast to, uh, to YouTube in a safe environment, as you know. Uh, we have also Elani, uh, Klasiu, uh, Ana Clara, they were all very uh, hardworking throughout this period. And of course, we thank the audience and all the speakers for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Professor Christian Madsen, for being here for two hours and a half, three hours already. And it's a great pleasure. Thank you to all of you uh, for being here with us. Muito obrigado a todos. I, I wish you all a very good week. Uma ótima semana a todos. And let's work for the next 50 years. Vamos trabalhar para os próximos 50 anos. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Have a good day. Muito obrigado a todos.